Merry Christmas. Welcome to Howard Memorial Presbyterian Church. We're going to begin our Christmas Eve service with a brief moment of silence. I'm going to point out to you on the front of your bulletin, there is a verse, a couple of verses, in fact, from John's Gospel. And that's something for us to think about tonight as we are about to welcome into the world again the Lord and Savior who was coming to us as a child and that is written about in very different ways according to the different Gospels. So let us begin our amazing worship service with a moment of silence before the prelude begins the service.
I invite you to stand and join me in the prayer of the day printed in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, from the tabernacle of heaven to the poverty of a stable, such humble love surrounds us tonight. In Jesus, you have become one with us. Open our hearts to receive him with joy. On this night when he was born long ago. Amen. Join me in the Christmas celebration printed in your bulletins. Jesus, you are God's holy child born of Mary. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, in you all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Christ, have mercy. Jesus, you are the word made flesh, full of grace and full of truth. Lord, have mercy. You may be seated. Our first and second reading, in fact, are both the story of Christ's birth as told to us by the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke tells the story 
from the perspective of building out of the Emperor Augustus census. Up to this point in Luke's gospel, he's focused a little bit on John the Baptist, who lays the groundwork for what Jesus will then build upon and ultimately save all of us through. So I'll read the first seven verses and hear an anthem, and then I'll finish 8 through 20 before we hear a homily for the night. Before we read scripture, let us pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious and holy God, you are coming amongst us as a child tonight. Quiet our hearts. Quiet our lives. So that we may look upon you as we listen to the scriptures about you. May your spirit inspire within us the joy that Mary and Joseph must have felt when they first laid eyes upon Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So everybody all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph went from the town in Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem. Because Joseph was descendant of the house of the family, excuse me, of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and they together were expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So baby Jesus has been born. At this point in the story, it's baby Jesus, it's Mary, and it's Joseph. But that is about to quickly change. In verse 8, it begins, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, for see, I'm coming, and I'm bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. But he's a Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. And here's how you'll know who he is. This is the sign to look for. You'll find a child wrapped in bands of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there with the angel was a multitude of heavenly hosts. They were praising God and they were saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on earth among those whom God favors. The angels then left them and went back into heaven. And the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child, and they were all lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made it known to them what they had been told about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds were saying. Mary wasn't just amazed. She treasured it. She treasured all the words, and she pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and that they had seen and all that had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Former Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren once said that he always reads the sports page first. The person who was interviewing him thought this was an odd thing for the Supreme Court Chief Justice to tell her, and so he, she said, why did you just tell me that? He said, because that's where they record people's accomplishments. Everywhere else in the paper, it is all about humanity's failures. The sports page is always tucked deep within the folds of the newspaper. Those of you who love the sports page know this because you have to dig through all the other mess of life to get there, to dig through the headlines of death and destruction and immorality and conflict before you get to that good stuff, to the accomplishments. That's where you see those stories of triumph and those stories of victory. It doesn't necessarily matter which team you root for, but there are always good things in the sports page. It draws you into a world full of hope, where people have overcome great odds to accomplish something amazing. That was why Earl Warren loved reading the sports page first. It's not a sports page. But this is a sports page here tonight. It is an accomplishment that you are here tonight. Did you think about that? It is an accomplishment that everybody is dressed and looking beautiful or just presentable, if that's how you see it. You overcame great odds to achieve these accomplishments. Because anytime you take these ingredients, you successfully put them together, you wrap up some holiday cheer with some family together, you put in a schedule with dinner, and then drive time, and then you tell them you're going to church, and you accomplish all of those things, go ahead and give yourselves a pat on the back. You did something amazing tonight. This is the stuff that fills great pages on the back of the sports page. But we don't really think about that, do we? All of you, I can see it, and some of your faces are just breathing a sigh of relief, not thinking this is a victory. It's not going to be in the newspaper tomorrow. I hate to break that to you. If nothing else, I will give you this. There will be a side note somewhere in the newspaper tomorrow. It will say this. Millions, if not billions, attended church across the world to celebrate Christ's birth, and you can say, that was my accomplishment. But then something else will take over. 
Something else will happen and you'll start putting away wrapping paper. You'll start writing a new schedule that says you've got to get ready to get rid of the decorations. Did you know that New Year's is one week from today? It's also on a Saturday, which is poor planning on God's part. It's the start of a school year pretty soon as well. The calendar year is about to get started and suddenly you are sad that you came to church because I'm talking about all this. It never ends, does it? You wanted to celebrate an accomplishment that you got to church on Christmas Eve. This is big news, Ben. But then you quickly moved on to something else. You wanted to rest a little bit, but the busyness never ends, and it's never newsworthy enough to make us slow down and to read it, right? And that's what you want to hear. That's what I want to hear. I want to slow down and smell the roses or smell these beautiful white poinsettias that are all around me. I want to take a moment, don't you, and put my feet up and relax in this season. That's what we always hope for. During this time of year, do you not go through the same thing year after year? You want to not worry about the rushing. You want to not plan so easily and last minute. You want to know what clothes you're wearing, and you want to enjoy this season with your family. Yes, I said it. Enjoy the season with your family. Sometimes you even say, I think that's what God wants me to do, right? That's what you want your minister to stand up here and tell you right now so you can go home and say, I finally listened to one thing he said that we should start listening to him and relax. But that's not what I'm going to tell you. I'm glad that you are sitting down to hear this because God doesn't want you to slow down. In fact, God doesn't want to even put your feet up. God wants you to start running with him. God wants to join, excuse me, wants you to join the greatest story of human accomplishment the world has ever known. As soon as you're going to try to settle into this story, to rest with any of the characters and the plot lines, you're going to be blown up and whisked away and asked to go somewhere else. My opinion is that it's better to join the action than to hope for God to tell you to slow down. Because tonight, you listen to me read one of the stories that you know pretty well. Tucked within the Gospel of Luke, is a story of Christ's birth told with unbelievably simple details. A young, unwed couple, they're going to Bethlehem. There's no room in the inn or stable or manger or wherever it was that Christ was actually born. There's some swaddling clothes or cloths, as Luke calls them, and that's pretty much the story of Christ's birth, right? It's a simple story, but it's actually much more complex. It's full of so much action and accomplishment. It is not easy to travel. The parents in this room know that. It is not easy to travel, especially if one in your party is pregnant. Throw in the fact that Joseph is not the father, so there's this cloud of suspicion kind of hanging over the couple. There's emotional and spiritual effects of a scandalous story that are generated all over the world. And then there's the reality of the child, right? This isn't just the precious baby that we think is beautiful in our own eyes. No, this is wonderful counselor, prince of peace, mighty God. This is not an easy story to travel with. So Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem. That is a huge accomplishment. And then what happens? They can't find a place to sleep. Maybe they aren't wealthy enough to afford a room, or maybe they looked really weird walking in late at night, or maybe the innkeepers were weary of offering lodging to them. Maybe they were just unbelievably late to town and every room was taken. They have been trying to keep moving and keep knocking on every door, hoping and praying that one person will be gracious enough to at least open the door so they can beg and plead and say, let us in. And they find that one person an unnamed innkeeper who saw something in that young couple. It is an accomplishment that they found some place to sleep. Maybe it was the way Mary glowed because I imagine her body was nurturing the Savior of the world and she just looked different. Or maybe it was the determination in Joseph's eyes that he was going to find a place for his soon-to-be wife to lay her head. Maybe the innkeeper just had a little ounce of gratitude that night Enough that he was willing to open his home, and he had to move things around. This is not just a come on in and hang out for the evening. This was a move things around, let me make sure my animals don't sit on you kind of a night. It was an accomplishment to find a place to sleep. It is always, as you know, 
been an accomplishment to find a warm, safe place to sleep. But that's not the last greatest human accomplishment of this story. In simple details, Luke tells us that it came time for Mary to have her baby, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes or bands of cloth, as he says, and laid him in a manger. There is absolutely nothing simple about birth, and that is the most male-written version of birth I've ever seen. Babies don't just arrive and you wrap them in bands of cloth. They move, they cry, they need things, they're tired. You're constantly wondering if you are doing the right thing and whether God knew that you should get an instruction manual with this baby. But we forget about that, don't we? I forget about that because I read this story and I look at my daughters and I think to myself, they looked at that beautiful Christ baby lying in a humble location in a small town and all they wanted to do was just stare at him. Even we would want to silence our phones. I know that's crazy. And we would want to stop taking pictures and we would want to nudge Mary to, hey, could you move over a little bit? I'd like to see this baby. We would want to admire his face because we were sure that it was glowing. We would want to tell them, you guys look great. It's going to be real easy. But the gospel writers won't let us settle into that space where we're sitting in a sweet hospital room or even a stable rocking the baby with Jesus in our arms, telling the family everything's going to be okay. See, God's a God of action and not of rest. When we think we're ready to put our feet up and to relax in this season, the good news will not rest in the warmth of a manger, even the warmth of a manger. Because instead of an instruction manual, Mary and Joseph are about to get some really smelly visitors because we are immediately whisked out to a distant field way outside of town where some shepherds or sheep herders are huddled together to keep warm in the cold of night and they're fighting sleep. You know that sleep, the middle of the night sleep that you want so badly but you can't have quite yet. The sheep, they can't let them wander off, or worse, they can't have a predator steal one. It's not a glamorous life, but it's something someone must do. The shepherds are an odd choice to bring the action to. They are literally as far away from the commerce, the religion, the politics, and all of the good stuff of this city. Ideas and arts and innovata- excuse me, innovation occur in the city centers. They still do, and they always have. The shepherds are nowhere near that, are they? It's noteworthy that God thought the first people to know of Jesus' birth are outcasts, are humble, probably illiterate, incredibly stinky people. Instead of going to an artist who could paint a beautiful portrait of the Holy Family or a writer who could pen a riveting tale of Christ's birth or a nurse who could come in and actually give them some advice, God takes the good news of Christ's birth to a distant field to a bunch of men who probably don't know anything about babies to have them travel a great distance. The minute that we start to come in and to start to feel excited about being in the manger and to rest just a little bit in the season, God explodes that out and takes us back out into the world. The good news is not for the innovative, the creative, the artists of the world, it's for everyone. And so the angels of God announce the great news to the shepherds and they are filled with this great hope and promise as Luke records it, and they go with haste. They didn't think too much about it. Suddenly, the people who couldn't leave the sheep leave the sheep. Something about a baby. A baby draws them to Bethlehem, and when they arrive, they can't stop talking. Did you notice that in the way Luke tells it? It's as if they burst in, and they know what's going on, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and Mary is probably just sitting there saying, he's asleep. It was true, They said, it was true. There is a young couple and there's actually a baby and he's actually wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's here in a manger. Mary treasured all the words and she pondered them in her heart. Everything comes back into the manger, all of the action. And while she is seated, we almost feel ourselves put our feet up just a little bit, ready to rest in the beauty of this season and then the shepherds go home. They leave, probably a little bit more noisy than they should have, and the story takes us back out. We don't really know where the shepherds go, just back out. And Mary and Joseph 
are with their child. And this is the point where parents sort of look at each other and say, okay, now what? But then God's story actually builds steam from there. We don't read about it tonight, but soon more people are going to be on the move. The Magi are going to travel to see Jesus before the Holy Family is then going to escape to Egypt. These are accomplishments that are written about very briefly. Jesus is then, 30 years later, going to be moving throughout the Judean countryside, being baptized, calling disciples to follow him, exercising demons, and transforming people's lives with his words and his deeds, because God is a God of action. The minute you think you're about to put your feet up and rest in the season, God's going to invite you to stand up and join him on the road to good news. Here's the reality of the Christmas story. It does not draw us in to the slowness of resting, but it actually draws us into the busyness of God's life. Because while you were shopping and decorating and dressing up and making great family dinners, we were all seeing God moving. While we, all of us, were running around town, finishing up, making all the things that we needed to do before the, God, excuse me, before the family arrives, we saw God moving. Did you see it when you watched the news and a young Syrian couple was walking away from Aleppo? They were Mary and Joseph because God is on the move. And while we were trimming the trimmings and practicing our homilies for tonight, we saw God moving amongst us when we saw the people moving around this church and saying Merry Christmas and wondering if they had a place to get a meal tonight. While we gather in this amazingly beautiful space with heat, thanks be to God, we give thanks and gratitude for the birth of a Savior long ago, but we're about to be asked to stand up and go join God's activity. This is not a story or a season to slow down. I'm sorry to say it, but it is one to hurry up and join God's busyness. Hurry up and see that the world is in need of the activity that God is already doing. Hurry up and see that God is already busy in your neighborhood with your families and your friends who need help, with your households and those that are seeking forgiveness and those that are trying to give forgiveness. God is active in this town and very much so active in this church. Hurry up and see that God wants you to get up and to go see the beautiful baby. God wants you to lean over and to awe at that beautiful baby and try and hold the baby. But then also, maybe ask Mary if you could change a diaper, and maybe if you could ask her to get that really good ice they give you in the hospital right after you have a baby. Don't slow down. Don't slow down is the message of Christmas. Join the activity because God is already active in this world. The story of Christmas is an active story of inclusion and invitation. It brings us into the manger where we want to stay and where we want to live in the very warm space, and then God blows us out to the winds and to the farthest of places and then brings us back and then takes us back out. It is one that invites us to open our doors just a little bit wider to set one more, maybe two more placemats at the table. It is one of inclusion for the lost, the lonely, and those without a home, or those that you have not seen in a long time, or those that you want to get back in your lives. This is what Christmas is about. Christmas is an invitation to feel the pains of the world, but do not let them overwhelm you, because we don't do this alone. God was born as a baby. We are walking towards that manger, but know that as soon as you get there, you're going to be asked to take it to the world. Merry Christmas. Amen.
may be seated. Friends, we have been blessed beyond measure, and we feel that tonight as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. Let us return to God a gift and a portion of our lives as the ushers wait on us for the evening offering. 